Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. Well, Rachel on Rachel. That's what this <laughs> Rachel <episode> squared. <laughs> yeah. Rachel Lowe is an old client of mine and a friend of mine. And I've seen her go through a lot of life changes. And one of the reasons I really wanted to talk to her was because of... She's like, when I think of side hustler, she's sort of the definition in my mind. And I think that you should listen to this episode whether or not you're a side hustler. Because... Whether or not you're someone who struggles with indecision, this will be this will be relevant to you. Feeling like shamed for having more than one interest and not sure how to pick one or if you should pick one. And also if you're someone who maybe doesn't struggle with this, you should listen to it because there are people in your life who do and it will make you better able to relate. That's to their what I was experience. thinking too, is like you might want to have a little bit more empathy for the people who are indecisive in your life. If that's not a problem people. for you, which I got to say, more people than not who I talk to in coaching struggle with this. So I think this is a pretty common thing, but there are some people who don't and you can understand the plight <laughs> of the indecisive. I also want to say that in about like 40 minutes into the episode, we talked a little bit about Rachel's frustration with everyone saying when things go back to normal. And it's very relevant because obviously it's being triggered by what's happening now. And in her experience, having, you know, in the past couple of years become a mom, she's like, there's no new normal to go back to. Like, there's no mm, normal oh, yeah. to go back to. And this is the same thing that we're going through now is such an upheaval. And I think it's a good thing because we keep saying it. And I think we need to have a conversation around what do we mean when we say we want things to go back to normal? What even is normal? Yeah. So we talk about that too. All right. So you cool. want to read her bio? Okay. Rachel Lowe has dubbed herself the quintessential slashy. She's a side hustler slash hummingbird and not the other way around. Though she embraces this nature now, that was not always the case. Since our culture often seems to push folks toward a singular focus, growing up as a person of many interests often brought guilt and shame. While decisiveness is still not a strength, She's found peace in the fact that she can't choose wrong. In the past three years alone, she's uprooted her life and business by leaving her job in the D.C. area to move to Colorado, moved twice more, bought a house, changed jobs again, and became a mother to an insanely adventurous and joyful little boy. What's next for her? We'll have to wait and see. (laughs) Have a good time with this conversation. Rachel's great. And we bring up a lot of episodes in the kind of as we're talking about this, like she's referencing back to a lot of our episodes too because she listens very regularly. (laughs) I love it. So I have a list of episodes for further listening that you should check out after this. So go to the episode notes for more on that. And we will see you at the end. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Rachel. Are you my first Rachel interview? You might be. I've had a few Rachel clients, as you can imagine. Yeah, I was on the one of the Ask Rachel ones. So we kind of introduced Rachel Squared, I think yeah. that's what we call it. I Rachel can't remember. Squared. But here we are officially. Yeah, okay, right. It was about time that I had you on for an hour-long conversation. Um, I'll link to that episode where you kind of, you sort of guest answered a Dear Rachel question because it was about marriage and I felt you were more qualified to answer it than Kristen or I was. <laughs> Inside hustler marriage, to be exact. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that leads beautifully into one of the reasons you're here is because I get a lot of people, a lot of clients. I wouldn't say it's just side hustlers, though I think they struggle with it the most, who feel incredibly indecisive, uncommittal. Mm-hmm. Is that a word? Uncommittal? Have a difficulty narrowing down their choices 
and feel a lot of shame about the fact that they can't just pick something and stick with it. So that was one of the major reasons I kind of had you in mind was, can we have a whole conversation about that and like demystifying that and untangling that? So first, I want to hear about your life experience as that person. Oh, gosh. Well, first of all, I think the most interesting thing is I go back to another podcast you and Kristen did where the too much, not enough. Yeah, I couldn't pick if I was too much or not enough. That was like the first choice I could never make. I was both, both <laughs> and all the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I think often people told me I was too much, like all growing up and it was I wanted to do everything. Like my my high school resume was like three pages long because I was in ever. <laughs> I wanted, you know, I wanted to be in choir, but I wanted to also be in band and I wanted to be in theater and I I just wanted to experience everything. Yep. And I, I distinctly remember my high school counselor when I asked her to write me a recommendation letter for college. And she was like, I've told Rachel again and again that she's taking on too much and she just can't do it, but she does. And like, (laughs) I was like, I don't know how to feel about that. I don't know whether that's like a compliment or kind of a, a diss. It's a both and, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah. Both and. And I just, I, I don't know why, but that just sticks out to me so much from high school. And I feel like that's how everybody described me. And so, I mean, how could you not carry this weird shame with you around it when, that's like written in stone in a recommendation letter that goes to your college. Yeah. And it's like Um, one of the identifying features people like point at you and say, this is her is someone who does too much or someone who can't decide on what she wants to do. So she just does everything. And then it kind of becomes part of your identity when that's how everyone knows you as that person. Right. And I think there's also this fallacy that that means I can't do anything well because (gasps) yeah, there's always that, oh, if you do too much, then you're not going to do any of it well. Um, and that's, I think that's what I felt in that sentence was like, well, she's trying really hard to do everything, but she, you know, I don't think she's going to do anything well, but somehow weirdly she does. And <laughs> like, right. Thank you. Right. Like against uh, all odds, somehow she's making it work, even though she shouldn't be quote unquote making it work. Yeah. So, you know, that continued through college. I think I changed majors like four times, but I don't know if that's, that's pretty typical from what I know. Uh, Yeah. Side hustle or not, that's a pretty common experience. (laughs) Yep. And then traveled a little bit after college, moved to DC for an internship, got a different job. Like I've been in probably seven or eight jobs. So I mean, I'm like kind of a typical younger person slash side hustler. Yeah. I just, you know, I, I, I'm somewhere for a couple of years and then I get bored and for me, boredom is about I'm not growing anymore. So when I feel stagnant, like I just don't want to stay. And I think that's a lot of my wanting to do a lot of things and being indecisive is I just I want to keep growing. I don't want to I don't want to be bored. Right. So I want to I want to get to the part where we reframe some of this indecision as not a bad thing and actually could be a positive thing if you let it. But I want to get more into the shame around it because I think there's a lot of familial shame that can happen. There's a lot of cultural shame. I think that there's this sort of, I think that guidance counselor kind of sums it up well in terms of the usual reaction to people is, well, you're doing it wrong or why can't you just pick something and stick with it? And so I want to hear more about the shame you felt around being how you are and not being able to control it. I think the first time... I realized how much shame I had around it. Cause I think shame is like, it was hidden in me for most of my life. Like I just didn't know why I felt wrong about the way that I was. But I remember watching, I'm sure she's talked about it several times, but one of Liz Gilbert's talks about the hummingbird theory. Oh yeah. And she kind of opened it up with this woman who was like, you know, you go around the globe talking about passion and we all have to find like our one true passion and I'm 40 and I just don't have one. So thanks a lot. Okay, bye. (laughs) And then Liz Gilbert was just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, you know, I touted this for so long. And it was like the first time I think I felt like I wasn't the only person who was like this. And I felt seen. And I think once I felt seen, then I could start 
like surfacing the shame, like, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I've been trying to dial myself back in order to fit in for most of my life and saying no to things that I wanted to say yes to because I didn't want to be too much. And I didn't want to take on that extra thing and have people see me as this unserious, can't do Mm. anything well, uncommittal. It is a word now. Um, (laughs) right. That just can't make up her mind. And you know, or I think of like silly examples, like when we go to a restaurant, I'm like, man, I just don't know what entree I want. Like it's as small as that. And it's as big as, yeah, who do I marry? Like, am I going to be happy if I marry somebody and it's that same person forever and just working through a lot of that? So yeah, I think, I don't know, it all, it all kind of came rushing to me when I was older, like the, the shame. And I think I just felt it in darkness for so long. Like I just sat there with it and was like, well, I'm just weird and I'm just never going to be quote unquote normal. Um, so I better figure out how to like mitigate it to the yeah. best of my fit in, you know, learn how to tamper myself and hold myself back from things so that I'm not too much. Right. So that I don't overwhelm people. Yeah. <laughs> the thing too is I got labeled as like overwhelming a lot you're just so much and you're just so overwhelming. I don't, I don't know what to do with you. So many feelings, so many ideas, so much energy, right? Like so many directions that you could go in. And for a lot of people, that's like, whoa, I don't like mm-hmm. there. Yeah. They have to have the capacity to handle that or else they're going to tell you it's too much because what they're really saying is, I don't know that I have the capacity to respond to all of this energy and inspiration and ideas. It's really more of a commentary on their abilities than it is about yours. Of course. But that's right. not how we interpret it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm I'm just <laughs> sitting here thinking about like all the conversations I had with people where, yeah, I would look at that. Like, I, I don't know how to respond right now. And then I would just, oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to go now. Like I would just oh. tell myself, like I, I legitimately, so one of the moments where I knew my husband was the right person for me was I was telling him a story. And I remember distinctly in high school, I would start telling stories And I could just see people like checking out in the middle of my story. (laughs) And then I would just make up some random ending that didn't make sense. Like, and then I went to the beach and my car ended up in the ocean, you know, and they'd be like, oh, that's great. Like, so you could tell (laughs) they were just not paying attention. And I did something like that to Greg. And he was like, what? Like, that makes no sense. Continue your story. And I was like, what? Somebody's still paying attention to what I'm saying? So yeah, I I just, I got a lot of that. Like, I just don't know what to do with your energy right now, Rachel. It's a lot. And, you know, which does make you think like, it is partly on me to sense that in other people and not like dial myself back, but also realize that I, I can't do that with everybody. You can't trust everyone to be able to handle that or to hold that space for you. That's right. Yeah. Right. You know, so I think, and I think that's part of the shame too, is like, we all want everybody to accept us, but yeah. that's going to happen no matter who we are, whether we're a side yeah. hustler or, you know, yeah. somebody else. But um, you make so- such a good point, though, that, like, all of us make up stories about why other people can't handle us. And for you, it's because you're too much and you're coming at people with all your energy and you're a side hustler. You can't make decisions. But for other people, it's a totally different story. Same result. Like, I'm not enough. That's why people don't like me or don't accept me. We will always find a way to make that make sense to us. Like, sadly, I wish that we didn't default to thinking, oh, let me make up a story about why I'm not acceptable and why I'm not likable. But that's usually what we all do. Yeah. Well, because I mean, we're tribal creatures, right? We want people to be with, which is why it's like so hard right now for many of us, right? Who are like, I just want to be around people and I'm either by myself or with one other person like continually. And so... Yeah, we want we want to shift ourselves to be a person that they like because we just want, you know, the attention and the friendship and the love or whatever it is that we're craving at that point. We want to bend ourselves into whatever, you know, mold will gain that acceptance. And, you know, side hustler or not, that's what happens. But I think for me, the distinct piece of it as a side hustler was just I was always trying to dial myself down, like turn it down a notch, like turn it down a notch, Rachel, mm-hmm. you're, you're right now. And especially when I get stressed out, that's when it like, I can't self manage it anymore. So it's just like the colorfulness and the talkativeness and the gregariousness. 
and the over, you know, the so many ideas come out when I'm, yep. you know, in a place either where I'm comfortable or stressed. That's like, that's kind of the two places where it comes out the most. Yeah. Well, right. Because when you're comfortable, it can naturally flow out of you. When you're stressed, it kind of escapes out of you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a healthy version when I'm stressed out. <laughs> that's yeah. a good, I was going to ask you that question. So maybe there, maybe there was more ways than just one, but I'm curious, how did you mitigate like being too much or not enough, right? Like how did you try to dial it down? What were some of the things that you did? Mm, man, I, I think I, I learned really well how to be a chameleon. So I, like, I learned to read kind of the energy of the other person mm-hmm. and match that. Yeah. Which, you know, can be a really great skill when it's used, like, not to be liked, but when it's used, you know, in certain situations, but I use it all the time. I would just kind of, oh, this person's more quiet. I'll be more quiet. Oh, this person's even more energetic than I am. I'll dial it up a bit. You know, I would just kind of yeah see what that person is and I would blend to basically act like them so that, you know, I could, I could gain acceptance it was one way that I did it. Yeah. A lot of it was just kind of forcing myself to make decisions when I didn't really want to, or like I wanted to do the both and, but people would tell me that wasn't possible. So I just like, okay, I'd like, want to blend things and make kind of my own <laughs> decision that wasn't A or B, but it was like this whole different decision. And I would just be like, well, I, I can't do that. So I just limited myself. Like I put these boundaries, these borders, these limits around so that I could be accepted and, you know, not overwhelm people. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that makes perfect sense. Every single person I coach at some point in their life made an unconscious choice. And it's always in childhood because it starts super young. It does. Right. To, I either get to be myself and receive love and acceptance mm-hmm. or I get to, or no, that's never the choice. <laughs> I was about to say, if you have a really good parent, that's the choice. It's, <laughs> I get to be myself or I get love and acceptance. I don't get both. It's like, if I'm myself, I'm probably going to end up being rejected because a lot of people are going to have issues with the fact that I'm not enough of one thing or too much of another for them. Or I amputate big aspects of myself so that I can keep getting love and acceptance. And it's just so ironic. And I've said this a million times before, but it's one of the most important things. So we can't say it often enough. It's just so ironic that in both of those situations, you don't actually end up with any love or acceptance. Because if you're being accepted for someone that you're not, if you had to amputate big aspects of yourself, that's not actually acceptance. And so it's really a lose-lose situation. And of course, we feel like there is no alternative in which we can be liked and accepted and continue to just be ourselves, which is the fallacy. Because maybe not everyone will, but there are certainly people like your husband who was willing to keep listening to you long after other people had tuned out who proved you wrong on that front. So at some point, obviously, you became more aware of the fact that you were doing this and that this was a problem. And I remember when you and I were were first coaching, I think one of the big permission slips you were able to kind of give yourself, I think probably aided by me encouraging it, was you don't have to choose. Like, you can actually just be, you can choose, it doesn't have to be A or B. You can do A- B or ABC or whatever combination you want. And that was not something that you'd given yourself any, per- you had not given yourself permission to, for that. Yeah. And that that's what I meant by like, I would force a choice, right? right. Like when yeah. I, was, I didn't really want to make one, I would force myself to make one. Um, like, yeah, I remember one of our first conversations. So my husband and I have a photography business together and I was like, I have to be only a photographer in order to be taken seriously as a photographer. Like that was just the message that I was getting the story. I was telling myself from all the other like education that we've gotten about being photographers, you know, and I have to, whenever I'm introducing myself, I have to introduce myself first as a photographer in order to be taken seriously. And I was like, I don't want to be only a photographer. Like that sounds so boring to me because it's one of the things that I like. And to me, the idea of taking any one thing that I like and making it the thing it's just like, oh no. I could just well, it's like a death, it. right? It's like a little bit of a soul like, death. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, we talked through a lot of permission around, you know, I can be a photographer and a trainer and do this other thing. 
you know, and like, and, and, and obviously within reason, right? That's, right. That's the other thing is like, I can't let myself completely fly off the handle because then I yes. really would be like, you know, all over the place and not doing anything well. So there, you know, there's kind of a middle ground there, but I think most side hustlers that I've met and even like a couple that I've talked to, yeah, it's like, we were like, well, we're so afraid of doing too many things that we then limit ourselves the other way. Like, mm-hmm. okay, I have to, I have to only have my job and like this one other thing. And that that's all I can do. I can't do my job and a side business and be a wife and be a parent and also want to be a coach on the side. And like, mm-hmm. I can't do other things. I have to be like, I have to pick the one or two and just focus there. And yeah, like whenever I thought about that, it just felt so deflating, right? Like, oh man, I don't want to have to make that decision. So yeah, we were, I think the, the way we phrased it was like, not choosing is a choice. And that, that was like my choice going forward is like, I don't want to choose. And so I'll do both. Yes. So many stories you have to, it's so interesting. The stories we have around, like just the rules we've made up. So you had this made up rule that you were taking very seriously about if I don't do photography full time, I'm not a a real photographer. Like that is just a rule. I'm like, who wrote that one down? Where do you see that one printed? Exactly. And I think that brings me back to that, that hummingbird aha moment of Liz Gilbert of just this societal message around like the one passion, right? Yeah. And all the photography education that, that my husband and I had been getting was like, oh, you know, I was, I was doing this job and then I found photography and I just threw everything else out Mm -hmm. of photography and like, oh, that's, you know, you're a photographer. And so you just hear that story over and over again. And you're like, oh gosh, I don't want to do only this. So I'm obviously not passionate enough about it to be like, that's it. So it's like, okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. You know, that story that like, if that's not all you want to do, then obviously you're not passionate about it. So oh don't do it. my God, thank you for bringing this up. I'm so glad we, we got to this point. I wasn't intending to get to this point, but you have blasted it open. And this is the thing that everyone needs to hear. Like the thing I have heard this story so many times, especially from side hustlers, but I've heard it from other people too, which is exactly what you said. If I don't want to make it my end all be all, I must not like it enough. I must not really love it. That is not true. I think, again, that depends a lot on your passion profile. Like I would say if you're a fire starter, a pure fire starter, you're going to be more likely to be the person who's like down with commitment to that degree. But if you're a side hustler to any degree, no, you're probably not. And also, I think that also kind of bleeds into my feelings, which I've made pretty clear, but I'm, you know, again, this is so important that I think sometimes we lean too hard into wanting our job to be the thing that fulfills us and almost to a codependent degree. Like, it's kind of like saying about a person you're going to marry, like, If this person doesn't fulfill all of your needs, then they're not right for you. When I think you know, as a happily married person, that your husband is not the person fulfilling 100% of your needs, nor should he be that person. And that doesn't mean that he's not the right spouse for you. And I think that's so, so true of passions or jobs or whatever, too. And so I think there was like a real kind of heady combination going on for you in feeling yeah. like, well, I must be doing something wrong. I must be broken if I'm not as into it as that person says that he is. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, it's funny you bring up the marriage thing too, because Greg and I are going on 10 years of marriage, but there have definitely been times where that story has leaked in, right? Of like, oh my gosh, this isn't perfect anymore. Like, what? What is that? Are we okay? And it's like, right. yeah, it's fine. And so, yeah, I think looking at it as that parallel of, you know, let's say like your job is your spouse and like this other thing is your friend and this other thing is your coach. And like, yeah, you have to like right. fill your life with all these sources. Right. And yeah, I think there's been this societal fallacy fed to us for a long time about, yeah, your job should be your passion. You better make money from your passion or like, what is that quote? I can't remember. It's like something about like never working a day in your life. Um, oh, right. If you do something you'll love, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Like, <laughs> That. Blah, blah, blah. That right there is like just 
the tip of the iceberg with it, right? Like we hear things, we hear these little anecdotes like that all the time. It's like, so no wonder we all grow up going, man, I don't love my job. What's wrong with me? Yes. Right. So yeah, I, I think, I think it's something that I wanted to be true, but I just, I, I never heard that it was true from anybody or at least, you know, anybody that I thought of as like a reliable source. And so yeah, when we started talking about that and the permission, it was like these doors opening of like, wait, what I, I can, I can do all the things really mm-hmm. being in your, um, one of your courses and like doing like hashtag all the sources. Like I was always like the <laughs> hashtag all the money, hashtag all the sources, hashtag all the things like that was just right. Yeah. That's the side hustler hashtag all the, all the blank. <laughs> um, you call it being a slashy, which I think is really fun. We, you know, yeah. like I'm a photographer slash trainer slash mom slash whatever else. Yes. Yeah. I don't know where people know where that comes from, but I'll give a little background. So it's one of my favorite movies, Zoolander. Oh, oh yeah. I don't remember. I did not remember that that was where this came from. Okay, continue. Yeah. So it's um, Fabio is up on stage getting the uh, best actor slash model award. <laughs> <laughs> Acceptance speech. He goes... He's basically like, thank you for this slashy. And you all think I am the best actor slash model and not the other way around. And <laughs> so, you know, it was like, I don't know, whenever I heard about side hustlers, like that's just where my brain went. But it was like, yeah, I got to be kind of like all the things in one sentence, just with a slash in between them. So I the love slashing. it. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I need, I have not watched Zoolander in like 15 years. So I did not remember that, but that's amazing. <laughs> Well, when your brain needs an absolute break, like Ooh. most of ours right now, it's a really good movie. <laughs> That's true. Like if you need to not think. Very brainless. Okay. Very cool, brainless, but yeah, you can only watch it every once in a while or you might go crazy. <laughs> so, okay. Now that you have sort of owned the fact that you are a slashy, that's just who you are. I don't think you're racked with shame about it anymore, but I think you probably still struggle because... Every personality type, every passion profile has their own kind of Achilles heel, the thing that they're going to struggle with. And I think for someone like you, I've seen you write me emails, even, you know, in the past couple of years where you're like still struggling to be like, should I pick something? Am I happy in this job? Is this what I want? So I'm kind of curious, how has the struggle evolved to match kind of where you're at now? (laughs) Oh, actually, I remember one of the stories that I was telling you which was pretty funny. We were looking for a house out here in Colorado and we looked at a ton of houses and I was kind of like, all right, I need a sign. Like which one's the best house. And we looked at the house we're living in now and our now neighbors popped out and were like the friendliest people ever. They had a two year old. I was like 30 some weeks, I think 33 weeks pregnant at the time. And she was like, Oh, I run a daycare from my house. And I'm like, wow. And then I remember like emailing you and going, Rachel, like I got a sign, but I don't, I don't know if it's like enough of a sign (laughs) to know that this is the right decision that I should make. (laughs) And you were like, seriously. And then, which led me to one of my favorite shows now ever with the good place, right? Yes. 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 Like the, the time when Ted Danson's character is like, well, I'm really glad you picked up on that one. Cause I sent you like five, but yeah, I'm always like, it's like, I always want somebody else to make the decision for me. (laughs) Like, yeah, whether it be a sign or like, I will talk to my poor, poor husband ad nauseum about things just kind of going back and forth. Another way it's shown up lately is like the job I'm currently in, like all signs were pointing to yes, but I still was like, I don't know. I really like the people at my current job. And what if I don't like them? Mm. I, I'm afraid to make this decision because I feel like it, it always makes me feel like I'm locking myself into something, even though. I am now leaving something that I quote unquote locked myself into a year and a half before. So it's still really freaking hard to make a decision. I think now I just don't beat myself up about the fact that I can't make a decision Yeah, or that it takes me longer than the average bear to make a decision. Yeah. (laughs) I think through it a little bit more and I have to kind of look at it from several sides and and sometimes I have to ask myself, like, is there a both and? Like, is there mm. is there a third option that I'm not looking at that might make me feel more of like a heck yes? So just it still shows up all the time. And I don't think it ever won't because then I wouldn't really be me anymore. Right. So I think with bigger decisions, I think with smaller decisions, I just don't I don't really care anymore. I used to literally agonize over like small, like I said, going to the restaurant and not knowing what I wanted to eat. Now I'm like, you know what? 
I might just get both or see if Greg wants the other one and split it or like, you know, I'll just kind of. <laughs> right. Again, both and um, the dinner. Yeah, like, woo-hoo. Um, but yeah, so it, that's how it shows up, I think, is in the bigger decisions. And often I find myself wanting to outsource the decision if I can. <laughs> and then if not, like kind of coming back to it and just being okay with the fact that it's going to take me a little bit longer to, to make the decision. I'm going to link to an episode. I think it was one of, one of my Rachel Rance ones that's coming up to, for me right now about the concept of equifinality, which is that all roads lead to the same outcome. So you can't choose wrong, which yeah. I think is something that's good medicine for someone who has a hard time making a choice is, you know what? You could pick that house or that house or this daycare or that daycare or this job or that job. And you want to know what? You're probably going to get what you were meant to get out of the experience. And, you know, all roads are going to lead to the same outcome for you. Yeah. The same lesson learned, at least, you know? Totally. There are two things that I tout all the time. And I I feel like I've mentioned them even in like the last few weeks to several people. Um, One of them is you can't choose wrongs. I use that all the time, right? Like, and I, (laughs) when I'm coaching people like at work, um, I'll say that like, you know, you can't make the wrong choice. Like you're either going to learn from it or it's going to be the right choice for you. Like I had a friend two days ago that was trying to decide between taking a new job or staying where she was. And I was like, you you know, whatever choice you make, you're going to learn from it or you're going to be happy about it. Like something's going to happen and it's going to get you where you need to go. Yeah. And the other one is if I think it's whatever is for you can't pass you by. Ah, yes, 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 yes. That's been like, that has been salved to my side hustler soul, right? Because yeah. I'll sit there and be like, I, God, I don't know what to do. Oh my gosh. What, like, should I apply for this? Should I like, should I, whatever, am I going to get this job? And I'll just like tell myself like, if this job is for you, it's going to happen, right? If yeah. this house is the one you're meant to live in, it'll happen. Yep. If this, you know, is what's supposed to come, then it's, it'll come. Yeah. Speaking of houses, this just reminded me of something, just a good little story of my brother and his wife just recently bought their first house and they're going to be moving into it in July. And the real estate market was hot. There was like six other bidders. And my brother's mother-in-law is a real estate agent, very good one. And so she said, write the owner a letter, tell them about your experiences, tell them about you just had your first baby. And they made an offer that was like, I think what he was asking for. And this guy turned down offers tens, I, you know, at least $10,000. He could have, he left a lot of money on the table to say yes to my brother and his wife. And they got that house. So that yeah. was their house. And yeah. they couldn't have missed it, even though the odds were definitely stacked against them in terms of the sheer number of people interested in it and the people who'd offered more money. And so, you know, like that worked out for them. And it was actually easy. Like, They'd been looking and, and looking and nothing was quite right. And then all of a sudden, this one just clicked. Eve, and the odds didn't matter. And the obstacles were just easily overcome. And yeah. I think that happens all the time when things are right, is they just kind of click like that. Yeah. It, no, that's true. I, I can't even tell you how many times, yeah, that's happened to me. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. But I don't know, like, like moving to Colorado. And I remember talking to you like right before... Yeah. <laughs> Literally, I got off the phone with you and they were like, would you like a second interview? And I was like, I don't know if this is going to happen. I was like, if, if it's supposed to happen, it will happen, right? Yeah. And I come to like, I, the first day I got here and I met with my 2B colleague, she was like, oh yeah, like 220 people applied for that job. And I was like, thank you for not telling me that before. Holy <laughs> I, crap. I was like, okay, so yes, I was meant to get this job. It was meant to bring me here, right? Like, that's just yeah. how crazy. One other thing that I thought of while we were talking is, I think another fear or another thing for side hustlers is we're just, we're afraid to make the wrong decision. Like we're afraid to fail. We're afraid to miss out on something else. So like a lot of times that's what's fueling the indecisiveness, right? Is like, but okay. But if we move into this house, what if right. in like a week, this other house pops up? And yeah, so it's that, that like grass having, is greener constantly. Yeah, like having to quash that, you know, that whatever it is, FOMO, oh my gosh, I'm going to fail miserably if I make this decision. I'm going to regret everything. Yes. Yeah. And I remember going through some of those like, okay, Rachel, let's talk about what's the absolute worst thing that can happen. Like, and having to live through it with you to be like, oh, okay. I guess it wouldn't be that bad because I would just blow it up in my head. Right. Like if Greg and I moved to Colorado, 
and I take this job with a pay cut, we are going to end up on the street in a ditch, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, off of wh- whatever. And it's like, okay, really? Let's, let's walk through that. <laughs> like what gets you there? I remember you were very, so overthinking the whole timeline of like having a baby and moving to Colorado. You were like, well, I should probably just wait and have a baby here and stay here for a couple more years because it would be kind of like weird to try to move to Colorado and get a job with a baby. What if I was pregnant? Blah, 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 blah. And I but asked I you this up here. So why would I waste that? Yeah. I don't I don't remember if you I don't know if you remember this, but I very clearly remember asking you, OK, what if you were in the process of moving to Colorado and you found out unexpectedly that you were pregnant? What would you do? And you were like, I guess I'd just figure it out. I'm like, uh huh. That's probably what you should just do now is like, just if you want to go to Colorado, go to Colorado and then let it happen. And you know what? It's funny. As soon as you moved to Colorado, it like you'd been trying to get pregnant. And then all of a sudden, oh, it just happened. Once you actually ended up in the place you were supposed to be in. (laughs) You know, yeah. uh, Yes. I thought about that many times. Not that, not that specific part of that conversation, but like, what if you move and then you immediately get pregnant? I was like, yep, that's pretty much what happened. (laughs) And you want to know what? You now have a uh, almost year and a half old baby and you figured it out, didn't you? We did. And we're still figuring it out every day. That's for sure. Right. Uh, <laughs> one other thing I was thinking about is, and I haven't really thought through this. So this is kind of a new thing for me. Okay. If that overthinking everything was like one of my mechanisms for dealing with my side hustler slashiness. Yeah okay, I have to learn to make decisions. So if I'm going to do that, I better learn how to really think about them. Yeah. Or if it's like just something that side hustlers go through, like if it's kind of a natural thing or if it's something that I built up to in order to force myself to make decisions. I don't know. I think it could easily be both and. (laughs) 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 But I think you make a very good point that and I think this is true of, of so many different things, is that if you are wired one way, you will often react and kind of end up at the opposite extreme to compensate for what you feel is a lack on right. one end of your spectrum. So that yeah. that would make perfect sense to me that you're like, well, I have to overthink it because I'm not good at making decisions, quote unquote. So I have to like really think hard about it to make sure that I compensate for my clear deficiencies. That's kind of the undertone I'm picking up on. I have to go and excel and make my two page pro con list before I can. (laughs) Right. right? Right. That's exactly what I was getting at. Right. Is Is it an overcompensation? Because I'd been told so often, like, why can't you just make a decision that, okay, well, if I'm going to make a decision, I obviously have to do it in this way. And that would, you know, it still pops up, but that was before I started to learn to be a little bit more trusting, right? Like of these things, like you can't choose wrong and whatever's for you can't, can't pass you. you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, before then I was like, I, I have to make the right decision. And in order to do that, I have to be so overly rational and so overly methodical that it's going to drive everybody else, including myself crazy. But then at least I'll make a decision. So it's just like, mm-hmm. I don't know, I haven't thought of it until just now, so dropping that new. Yeah. 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 Remind me and other people will be interested. What's your MBTI type and what's your Enneagram type? I am an ENFP number two on the Enneagram. Okay. Strengths finder. I also know. I don't know if you're. Sure. Shoot. That one I have. Woo is my first one. I was about to say like, duh. (laughs) Connectedness and then relator communication. And the one that gets me in the most trouble, I think, especially as a side hustler is achiever. So my side hustlerness has often manifested as I have to do everything, right? I have to achieve everything and get all the awards and, you know, be the valedictorian and also get this scholarship. And so it's just, it's always been about like accomplishing things, which makes it even more exhausting than I think if it weren't paired with something like that, where it wasn't this like overt drive to just accomplish things. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so <laughs> I know I'm, I'm very into all the personality things. I actually do that as part of my job. So well, I just want to point out that like as an ENFP type two on the Enneagram, that's like big feeler energy, yeah. just a lot of heart and a lot of, you know, feelings and intuition. 
And it would also make it so it would make perfect sense to me that you would kind of, in a way, be counterbalancing that with being overly rational and logical. Yep. Totally. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, <laughs> I feel that for sure. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay. I don't want to totally leave this conversation behind. And there was something else that you and I really wanted to talk about because it's very relevant right now. Yes. And I think we can probably weave in some of your, you know, some of your side hustler struggles with this too. But lately... As a side hustler. <laughs> wait, say that again? It's hard not to weave in your side hustlerness as a side hustler. Like, <laughs> it's, 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 you can't help it. <laughs> it Lately, the world has been very much kind of prefacing every conversation with when things go back to normal. And it's been pissing you off. And yeah. so I want to hear you rant for a second about why that's pissing you off. Oh, I got to do a Rachel rant? Yes. Yes, Rachel rants volume two. Yes. So I don't know that I noticed it until I was on a work call like two weeks ago. And somebody said, yeah, we'll do that when things get back to normal. And I just, I don't know why, but in my brain, I was like, things are not going back to normal people like stop it. And I, I think what it brought up in me is another huge shift that I've had in, in my life, which is motherhood. And the thing that you hear there all the time, which is, oh, well, when my body gets back to normal, when my blah, blah, blah gets back to normal. And it's like, do you realize like what your body just did? Like, there's no back like to like, go to. Yeah. Shift, right. So, I mean, I think this idea of finding a new normal is interesting, but just this whole idea that like we as a culture are in this like hurry to get back to something. Like obviously there is something huge being ushered in right now, like yeah. on a global level, on an individual level for most people, you know, just, Hey, like pay attention. Shifts <laughs> are happening. Things yeah. are happening. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's be done with that. So I can like schedule this training. <laughs> it's like, stop. I think it just, it brings up for me the, the unawareness, which, you know, in myself, but also just in our culture, right? This, I don't know, this hurry to get back somewhere to like move backwards or to get, yeah, I don't know, like make something great again. Right. And yeah. It's like, stop. Like, ah, I want to move forward. And you know, I think that's just my personality. Like I said before, I don't like it being bored. I like growth. I don't like being stagnant. So this is on the grandest of scales, like inviting exponential growth in a very uncomfortable way. But it's like, hey, let's grow. It's like, well, I don't want to grow. I just want to like go back there and keep doing what I was doing because it was easy and it was comfortable. So I don't know. Yeah, just this this fallacy and, and how often I hear it. And I will preface this with how often I hear myself say it too, right? Yes, yeah. Like, I, you know, I'm talking on Zoom. That's like the new noun. I'm Zooming somebody. Right, right. So, yeah. Um, like I'm on Zoom talking to somebody and I like three times I'll hear myself, oh, when things get back to normal, I'm like, oh, stop. So I'm becoming aware of it. And I think that's probably why I'm like heightenedly upset about it because I realize how much my own mindset is around that. Yeah, yeah. I was really glad you brought it up because I'm not sure I'd spent much time thinking about it until you said that. And that's because, first of all, we've all had a little bit of whiplash adjusting to a very odd new reality. And while I think it's totally fair to want to return to a, to a semblance of stability, right? To right. want health and security for everyone, financially and physically and all of that, I do agree that there is no such thing as a normal to return to, not when something this big happens. It's very identity shifting. Yeah. And so I guess what I want to do is I, I want to talk a little bit more about you becoming a mom and adapting that as part of your slashy, because that was a new normal you had to adjust to. And I think that we can learn from how you've had to integrate a new identity into your experience and yes, you had preparation for it, but nothing can really prepare you, right? Like you're pregnant and that's physically you're preparing for it. You're somewhat mentally, emotionally preparing for it. And then someone hands you a baby and it's like game off, right? Like yeah, everything changes. <laughs> yeah. And I think a parallel for me was we live in like a very granola place. Like we're right near Boulder, Colorado, which is like the, you know, yeah. epicenter of like all things natural. So obviously yeah. we're going to like all the natural birth classes and, Oh, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be like, like water birth and whatever. 
And my birth was nothing like that. Um, (laughs) It was very long, insanely grueling. I think my husband's still recovering from like witnessing (laughs) what happened. So it was, it was a lot and it was not what I wanted. It was not what I expected. It wasn't in the package that I expected to become a mom. Kind of like we're all experiencing, right? Like this global awakening is not coming in this beautiful package. It's coming in this like really ugly. Yeah. Horrible, like horrible thing. And so it started off, right? Me already mourning, like, okay, that didn't go the way I want. And now I'm in this new identity immediately trying to figure out how to feed another person, how to like handle a baby. Because that's, that's the thing too, is like you get all these birth classes and there's like no class on, okay, now you have a baby. So here's what you do. Which is, you <laughs> It'd know, be helpful to go to baby classes, not just birth classes. <laughs> like the last half of the last day of birth classes, like babies, um, make sure you hold their head and here's how you diaper them and good luck. Right. It's like, okay, great. But <laughs> it's a parallel as well though about you know, uh, one of our, we photograph a lot of weddings and it's the same thing in the wedding industry. Like let's talk about your wedding. Let's plan all your wedding and coordinating everything and the colors and the theme and the things. And then you're married and you're like, Oh, wait, what? I have to, no one taught me how to do that. I exist with this other person with, you know, for a lot of people, it's not, that one's not a huge shift right away in the way that becoming a parent is, but it, it is like a, it's a seismic shift. It's just slower. Parenting is like, boom, here's the baby. Good luck. Right. You're right. Just like, ah, so, you know, I was, I was re figuring out my marriage to this amazing person. I was figuring out who this other human that I still can barely communicate with is <laughs> figuring out what he needs. And I think the, and we've talked about this too, but like the hardest thing for me was that that identity, I mean, rightfully so, but it trumped every other identity that I had. Like I was for at least a couple months, probably close to the first year, I wasn't really anything else. I was like a mom. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I got like livers of other things, but that, that was it. And especially as like a side hustler slashy, that was like, I don't know that I dug into how overwhelming it was from that point because, you know, so much of my life I'd been, well, for the first good chunk of my life, I've been trying not to be all the things. And then I was like embracing being all the things. And now I was this one thing. Yeah. And not necessarily by choice. And so it was like, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> and, you know, I've had to very slowly start to uncover like the other parts of my identity. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I mean, I think what it's telling me is, first of all, like identity shifts don't, A, they don't happen in the way that you want or expect most of the time. <laughs> they might, but that's not very, not very common. And the other one is, I, I guess I just never expected it to be such an overwhelming shift that completely overshadowed the rest of my life to the point where I'd have to like dig out the other identities to kind of bring back the other Mm -hmm. slash. And, you know, I'm still very much in that process. You know, being a mom to a newborn is very different than being a mom to uh, an infant and being a mom to a toddler. And I can't even imagine being a mom to like a tween and a teenager. So it's like, it's like a constantly shifting identity. It's not like, Oh, cool. Well, I'm a mom now. So check. (laughs) Right. I don't know. And I think the thing that drove me crazy, and this is probably me going into like, you know, some of those shadow places that I hadn't really wanted to uncover and was forced to uncover becoming a mom was just like, why did nobody tell me this was so freaking hard? Like, why? <laughs> and it's like, I'm sure people tried to tell me, but you can't hear those things until you're in it, like until you're ready to hear it. Mm-mm. I think, but it did, it did kind of open me up to being a bit more raw in like what I share with people and being more like less polished, just being like, Hey, this is what's going on. Uh, this is freaking hard. And if you want to talk about it, let's talk about it. Cause I think there's this like hiddenness. We all have to like, look like we have it all together and look like we have it figured out. And you know, the Instagram, Facebook society of let me show you my highlights. And I'm learning how not to do that, like how to show you maybe some of the bloopers and yeah, just talk about how difficult it is because it's, it's not easy. And I think some of the, (laughs) I think my sensitivity to some of those euphemisms, like back to normal kind of came from becoming a mom because not only do you hear things like, Oh, I can't wait till my body or my whatever gets back to normal, but you hear things like, 
don't you just not remember what it was like before having a baby <laughs> or mm-hmm. isn't it just that? And it's like all these things. And you're like, you know, yes, it's amazing. And I do remember the rest of my life or you know, all these other things. And it's just these societal messages that we perpetuate. Like they just, yeah, I don't know that I realized how much they bothered me before that. Yeah. So, I think yeah. you're teaching us a lot about this. And I think one of the things you, you said that I want to like just highlight is that there's a lot of whiplash and grief that goes into your identity changing. And you, the best point you made was that, well, you made a lot of good ones, but one of the best ones was that often identity changes are not your decision. They just happen. Yeah. And it's, it can suck. And it might be something that you have to work through. And it, what's funny is that I think people assume something like becoming a mom, if that's what you wanted, why are you grieving? Like, because every transition, wanted or unwanted, comes with something ending and something that needs to be mourned and something that's a loss. And yeah. I think that what's happening right now for people is kind of the end of one chapter and the beginning of a very odd, very unwanted chapter for everyone. And that does require, that does require grief. And what I think is interesting is that, also interesting about what you said, is that you ended up getting what you thought you'd wanted your whole life, which was, I am one thing. And then you got it. I'm a mom. Eclipsed everything else in your life. And all of a sudden you were like, oh no, I miss being a slashy. Actually, this is who I am. And now I've got to go work to get back to that, which is kind of, I mean, it's kind of validation for you. Like that is who I am. Because if I was really meant to just do one thing, I'd probably be fulfilled by just one thing. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) So, um, oh gosh, this is a, this is such a good conversation. I don't want it to end. I know there was something in there that I I wanted to say, and I know I can't remember because that's usually what happens in good conversations. You're like, no, so many good things. Well, I do have one big last question for you, which is why do you think that for the people out there who can relate to you, especially the side hustlers, but just also the people who feel indecisive or who have been told, why can't you just stick to something? Or, or, you know, some of those people who feel like, is there something wrong with me for not being as into this thing that I'm supposed to be passionate about as that other person is? Like, why would you say, or what would you say is actually the benefit of being someone like you? Like, why is it actually great? I think, um, and it's bringing back even to my like connectedness strength. I think the benefit and the power in people who refuse to choose is that like we bring a lot of things together. Like we, you know, we bring a lot of random interests and we kind of cross pollinate and we often are the creators of brand new things, right? Like we're like, I don't, you know, I don't like that exactly. And I don't like that exactly. So I'm going to take part of that and part of that. And then there's, oh, there's this other part. And we just build these like random new things and we come up with crazy new ideas um, that often cross the boundaries of, you know, what would typically be thought of as this is this job or this is this genre. Like we'll create the new genres. We'll be like, no, you know what? I don't like pop or jazz. I'm going to be in the middle. I'm going to do this new thing. So I feel like not like other types can't do that, but that's just naturally like our type. And so I think once people give in to that and they, allow themselves to kind of start cross pollinating and not be ashamed about it. I mean, the world's going to see so many cool new things because Mm -hmm. we're the ones doing, you know, all the crazy remixes of stuff. Um, Yeah. I feel like to kind of tie the two, isn't it kind of meta that you and I had a very side hustler conversation? Like we talked about one thing for like half the time and then we switched to this other thing for half the time. But now I'm going to create something that I think ties it both together, which is, I think that what makes side hustlers and or slashies who they are is that they're very good at pivoting. Like they are good at like growing and looking to the next thing and pivoting to the next thing and being a little like being maybe more adaptable and open to change than the average person, which makes them the ideal kind of person to thrive in a world like the one we've just, you know, kind of been thrust into. Right. I mean, right now, I think that the people who are innovative, the people who are creative, the people who are good at pivoting are going to potentially have an easier time than those of us who are very stuck in our ways and very resistant to change and very 
maybe not good at like being open to multiple possibilities. And if you are like that, you might have a little bit of an easier time adjusting and thriving. I remember hearing somebody say, I think it was like the last economic crash in 2008, like how many new companies and new industries even like came out of that. And, you know, we're just starting to see the beginnings of yeah. shifts in the way yeah. that we shop, in the way that we, you know, experience a lot of things. And not most of those, thankfully, hopefully will not be super long term, but they are going to have lasting effects in how, in mm-hmm. how we all move forward. Yeah. So it's going to be crazy. And I don't know. Like, yeah, I know. I'm like, I'm excited. And then I was like, oh, maybe that's a bad thing to say. Right. But that is like the side hustler nature, right? Like we don't always love change. We love the change that we want to see. Of course. But we're accepting of the change that we don't want to see. Like, yeah. like we might grieve it for a bit, but I think we, not that we get over our grief faster, but like even while we're grieving, we're starting to try to find. Yeah. The opportunity you know, amidst the challenge. And so it's kind of like a, a both and imagine that <laughs> right that right exactly yeah that we're like you know we're going through it with everybody else but we're also like okay what am I going to do with this time right what like yeah what am I going to shift how am I going to pivot or how am I going to use this to yeah. you know create something new or whatever it yep. is yeah. yeah you guys are often very good at being optimistic and yeah. just yeah like sometimes <laughs> Yeah, maybe to a fault sometimes. But like, I I love that. As someone who's just like a lifelong pessimist and who, you know, has to pretend to be an up, like fake it till I make it when it comes to optimism. I just love that you guys are very, very good at finding the silver lining. And that's something that we need. And so I just want to tell all of you, you know, I want to like kind of big, big last point here. Brene Brown says you can't selectively numb emotions. If you shut off shame and anger and all of that stuff, you also shut off joy. Like you shut off the whole spectrum. And when it comes to slashies and side hustlers, you can't selectively, you know, have the best parts of yourself and deny the work, you know, the parts you think are the worst parts of yourself. So you can't have all the creativity and the energy and the inspiration and the optimism and the ability to see the silver lining and the adaptability and the pivot, you know, on the, the ability to pivot. And also hate the fact that like sometimes you're indecisive, sometimes you have FOMO, sometimes you wish that you know you're you're interested in that greener grass over yonder. Like yeah. that's okay. You kind of have to take the good with the bad. That's part of that's that's true for everyone. Yeah. But that's that's our, that's our sandwich. Yes, that's sand. your shit sandwich. <laughs> exactly. Everyone has yeah. a different one. That's yours. Okay. Ours is like, yeah, the indecisiveness and the often feeling like we're overwhelming and like not sometimes overwhelming ourselves. That's like a whole other thing that we often, it's not even just other people. We overwhelm ourselves, but right. I I agree. And I think once we can get past that and realize that we're never going to stop having a hard time making decisions, it's going to shift what it looks like. Right. But you know, but on the other side of that, yeah, is this kind of connectivity and creativity and positivity and all these great things that, especially right now, people are craving and looking for like, let, you know, let it fly. <laughs> like, like be proud of it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe the slashies need to rule the world. <laughs> so, okay. This has been awesome. Yeah. Tell people anything you want to tell them about what you're up to and or where they might find you if they're interested in learning a little bit more about Rachel Lowe. So, um, as I mentioned, my amazing husband, we have a photography business together. So we're based in Denver slash Boulder, Colorado, because you can't do just one. You gotta be in between both. So we are at rachelandgregphoto.com. And we are also about to start our own podcast, which in my indecisiveness is to be named, but it will be. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but we, cause we decided a long time ago that blogging was just really hard for us because we are both conversationalists. We just like to talk. We're like, well, maybe we should just talk and share with Record people that, that. Way. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, we're going to be kind of riffing on random topics like returning to normal and parenting lessons and all sorts of crazy mm-hmm. stuff that we've been going through together, you know, as husband and wife and talk about all sorts of things, maybe interview people, who knows? It's, Again, you know, of course. I was going to say it's a side hustler. So, you know, it could take many directions and probably will. So once I have more information on that, I will get it to you. But we're excited Do about that. that. That's, one of our, that's one of our quarantine projects, right? Okay. Starting our podcast. Well, 
Whenever you get that to me, I don't think you're going to have a full podcast ready to go by the time this episode goes live. But whenever you do, I will update the show notes so that if people are listening to this or finding this later on, they can go to the show notes and they can look and see what it's actually called. I'm excited. I think (laughs) I have a feeling it's going to be an awesome name. It just hasn't landed yet. That's all right. Let it percolate. Right. Well, I'll link to your I'll link to your site. I know that right now people's weddings are getting shut down or rescheduled. However, maybe you're planning a wedding for a year from now and you're in the Denver Boulder area and you want a photographer. Well, I think it's probably safe to plan for a year out. <laughs> so yeah. why not reach yeah, out to we, Greg and Rachel? Yeah, we just had one get uh postponed. So we're gonna we're gonna like photograph the computer screen of their they're still getting married, but then they're gonna have their party later. So we're gonna like That's- photograph. That's hilarious. So I know you got it. You got to work with what you have. (laughs) Well, thank you for coming on. This was long overdue. Like I've wanted you to come on and talk about side hustler problems for as long as I've had a podcast. Like it's been, and it's been in the back of my mind. So I'm glad that it, you know what? I think maybe divine timing. This is a really good time to have this conversation. It is. Yeah. And thank you for, I've I've been dreaming of being on your podcast. (laughs) I heard the first normal one. I was like, maybe someday I'll be a normal person. Here you are. (laughs) But yeah. And you know, I think talking about side hustling right now is very different than if you'd talked to me even like six months ago or a year ago. So exactly. Divine timing. Yes. All right. Well, thank you. I think you're the absolute best slashy in town. (laughs) And I will talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. We will be back on Tuesday with a new Magic 8-Ball episode. You don't know what you're going to get. I mean, I know what you're going to get, but you don't know what you're going to (laughs) get. We've clearly leaned into our status as witches you get psychic readings from at a carnival. (laughs) Definitely that, not like the really legit ones. No, like no, the no, 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 the ones, ones with like smoke machines <laughs> and like, you know, like fake headgear and like that sounds a- right. appropriating cultures accidentally, <laughs> you know, like, like, like the real shoddy ones. I feel like we're, we've leaned into that between our readings when I'm not a psychic, but doing our card readings and doing our magic eight ball episodes. Like yeah, we're really leaning we're, on that like, magic really side. corny people mm-hmm. right now. <laughs> Anyway, well, I hope you enjoy the corny psychic stuff because for God's sake, we need some thing light, but also helpful. Yeah. If you don't like it, you don't have to listen on Tuesdays. That's, that's fine. <laughs> it's not, I make it sound like it's that hokey. I'm like, no, it's just, it's actually just a, it's just a blog or an episode yeah, we, we once it's published. Just it's it's actually episode. just a really normal thing. <laughs> but I like to think of us as like those circus psychics when we publish Magic 8-Ball episodes. We can. We should do a little. Uh, a little image of that somehow. I don't want to. Sh- I don't want to spend eight hours photoshopping myself. All right. We will see you on Tuesday. Bye.